So uh, Scarborough nite wakeno, then um Oswego nite wakatuncho. Um so my name's Aaron Hayward. Um I also have a name that's in Anishinaabe Moan. Um two of my aunties named me when I was I think I was 16 and uh so they named me Kwe Ikudang Beka Minidu Wabo. And um uh, my name in Anishinaabe Moan actually tells me what my responsibility is to creation. So I take that very seriously. <laughs> um so a little bit about my background. Um I actually met Corey when we were doing our undergrad together, and uh, I did a, a bachelor's of science in biology and geography. I have a postgraduate certificate as a cartographic specialist, and I completed my master's of science in environmental and life sciences. So I actually have a, a focus, even though it's it's kind of this broad uh, degree, but I focused on the aquatic toxicology of freshwater mussels. Um, in my spare time, <laughs> I don't really have much spare time, but I, uh, I'm i the speaker or the president for Nietzsche Gwendida and Anishinaabekwewek Services Circle, which is a Indigenous Women's Counseling Organization in Peterborough. Um, I'm also on the board of directors at the Nobushi Winnow Friendship Center. And uh, I'm also a core member of the coordinating team for something called Revitalizing Our Sustenance Project, which I'm um, unapologetically going to make a little plug for. <laughs> so um, this is my most recent endeavor. It's kind of one of my big passions. One of my biggest passions is growing Haudenosaunee varieties of, of seed. Um, just like our indigenous languages, the one that I speak a little bit of is Gunyageha or Mohawk. Um, our seeds are also endangered. And, you know, if you look around, if you go for a walk in the woods, you can tell that indigenous varieties of seed are struggling, right? And it has to do with the colonial history of this country. Um, but uh, Haudenosaunee varieties of corns, beans, squash, potatoes, sunflowers, stuff like that are, are also endangered. And so um, it's one of my biggest passions is growing these things. I actually, right behind me, I've got a couple varieties of Haudenosaunee types of beans that are growing. So it's something that I do for fun. Um, so I wanted to start my talk off by explaining a little bit about kind of my mindset, so how I, I approach my talk. Um, in Haudenosaunee communities, when we gather, we usually start with something that's called the Ohondrakariwadek. Um, some people will translate that out to the Thanksgiving address, but it actually doesn't translate to, out to Thanksgiving address. It translates out to um, the words that we say before all else. And what I've been taught by language, um, fluent language speakers, as well as some elders, is that the reason that we do the Ohondrakariwadekwa at the beginning of our, whenever we gather as people, is because we as humans are extremely forgetful. And we're taught that, um, you know, we're the kind of the last, one of the last beings that creation created. And it's our responsibility as humans to take care of the rest of creation. I find it interesting that people go their entire lives wondering what the meaning of life is, when the meaning of life is literally to take care of life. And um, so when we do the Ohantra Gardi Wadekwa, we go through all the different aspects of, of creation. I mean, we don't go through absolutely everything, but um, when someone recites the Ohantra Gardi Wadekwa, we, it's kind of like we're listing all the elements of an ecosystem. And we're giving thanks and we're acknowledging them. And so when someone does the Ohandra Gerdewadekwa, um, you know, they might thank specific species of fish. They might thank specific species of trees and medicines. And it really depends on who is doing it and what that person has experienced in that day. Um, so this is kind of where my ideas for what I wanted to talk about today come from, is that we as humans are forgetful. And so sometimes we need a little reminder as to the reason why we do the work that we do. I wasn't really sure, you know, what kind of backgrounds the people that would come to this talk were, whether you guys would be, you know, experts in science or whether you would be educators, or maybe you were just people that enjoy, um, you wanted to come to something, you have a little bit of spare time, and maybe you were just interested to find out what we were going to talk about today. But um, I wanted to make it so that this talk would be available for everyone so that anybody can understand what, what I'm talking about. 
to indigenous women were taught that water, um, water, water is precious. Um, to indigenous women, you know, when we're, when we're taught about water, we are taught about our responsibility. I have, I guess, an increased responsibility because of what my name is. Um, my name in Anishinaabe Moan, if you were to kind of translate it, it talks about the fact that um, I have a responsibility for observing, listening, and just taking in everything about water at a specific moment in time. It's, um, it's this responsibility that I have for, uh, for listening, right? And, you know, I find it funny that sometimes a lot of non-Indigenous people, when they hear Indigenous communities, when they hear us talk about water, when they hear us talk about life, right? A lot of the time, people will say that, you know, we speak to the animals and we speak to the water. And some people that come from a different worldview, a different way of looking at the world would, would kind of see that as a little bit weird. Like, I find some people are like, what, you actually talk to the water? And um, I find it funny because the way that we view talking and listening is very different, right? You can listen to somebody by just observing them by just looking at them and paying attention to what they're going through. Um, and so when we think about water, we think of water as a spirit. Water is alive, right? Um, she is the lifeblood of mother earth. We have to take care of our blood. Um, she is our mother, right? In Ganya Geho, we call her and that translates out to, um, it's literally telling you that, that she's our mother. Um, in Ganya Geha, we call our mother um, Aget Nistonha, uh, Nistonha, right? The, those two words are very similar. Um, water has memory, right? If you think of, even if you think of places where we've put up dams, that water wants to get around that dam and will try everything possible to go back to the way that it wanted to flow, right? And so if you think of water, water is alive because she's always moving. And she's always, she's always doing her responsibility to take care of the rest of creation. Um, we, we view water as our family, right? So when we go and we give thanks to water, we see her as being a part of us, right? She is inside of us. We're like 80, I think it's like 82% water, something like that. Um, but that water is our family because she takes care of us and we have to take care of her. We have to be reciprocal in that relationship. So when we think about water, water flows downhill, right? That's kind of the basis of um, the concept of, of, of water, right? She, she will flow wherever it is that she wants to go. And if we look at Turtle Island, we can see that when, when she wants to go in a certain direction, she has these specific places, right? We call them watersheds. Um, depending on where you are, I, like where I live right now is on the Oak Ridges Marine. And I brought my sister to this one spot and I, I told her, you know, when you're standing here, if a raindrop falls here, it will flow over into Lake Ontario. But if you're standing on the other side of this hill, and the raindrop falls there, it will actually flow into Lake Scugog. And she thought that was the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I, I, I completely forgot because I have a, you know, I've been so focused on the science of water that sometimes you forget to think about the beauty of what you're learning about, right? And so in that moment, it was reminding me that I need to, I need to remember to just take in to observe without being super scientific all the time, right? And uh, so that's just something that I wanted to share with you guys. When I was putting this together, I, I wanted to have images that reminded everybody of our responsibility, right? Images of things like eutrophication or the waters not being able to breathe, right? Um, places, I'm sure many of you guys can think of places where you've walked by and it might have looked like this, right? And this reminds us that the water is speaking to us. She's telling us that there's something wrong. 
that there's something that us as humans have the responsibility to fix, right? And in this case, we're talking about phosphorus, right? We're talking about the fact that us as humans are growing our food in a way that is making the water sick, right? And so we need to start changing the way that we're growing our foods. We're not using so much fertilizers and nutrients that are going to um, go from the land, you know, from that spot on that top of the hill and flow down into the lake, right? Everything that we do on the landscape is eventually going to make its way back into those lakes, into those organs of Mother Earth. And eventually they're gonna make their way into the ocean. So there's this big interconnected loop that's going on. I mentioned Lake Erie, and so I wanted to put a big picture here. Um, Lake Erie is known for being eutrophied or going through eutrophication. And it's not the only place in Ontario that does this. There's tons of places throughout the states. You know, I remember I was doing field work when I was in my undergrad and I, we had to go and take some water samples. And I remember driving by this place and they had us take a water sample and it was just green. It was totally green. And I thought, oh my gosh, what is, what are people thinking, right? When you see the water like that, you know there's something wrong in, in your gut, you know, you can feel it. You can feel that there's something totally wrong with that place. And so it's our responsibility as humans to take care of that, to fix it. Waters have a fever, right? There's all different ways that the water speaks to us. And so one of the ways is that the water, the waters can get a fever, right? Just like us as humans, we, when we are sick, right? Our bodies will get really hot and then get really cold, get really hot, get really cold. And sometimes I'm sure you guys can think that you've had a fever and it feels like every five minutes your temperature is just going crazy and you can't regulate your temperature. And so that's exactly how what's happening to the waters, right? This is a graph of uh, Lake Superior and uh, this is showing the average temperatures, the surface water temperature over uh, 2020, right? The year that just passed. Uh, what we're starting to see, I'm sure some of you might know this if you study water, is that the waters are heating up, right? The waters are getting hotter, and this is having all kinds of effects. You know, there's certain species of fish that will only be able to survive when the water is below certain temperatures. Um, and so if we think about the water as being alive, right? We can understand that she is, she's sick and she has a fever. She's trying to fix something. When we have a fever as humans, our body is trying to kill off whatever disease it is that we um, have inside of us, right? And so as the waters are heating up, she's responding in this exact same way. Here's some pictures of uh, the Great Lakes um, this year, actually. And I wanted to show how this concept of a fever comes into play. So, you know, in the summer, the water's heating up. And even if it's just a slight amount higher than normal, it has drastic effects across the entire watersheds that are in the Great Lakes regions. Um, and so on the, on the left, you can see a picture from February 20th, 2021. I don't know if anybody else likes to ice fish here. I love to ice fish. It's one of my favorite things to do in the winter. And um, so you can see that February 20th, 2021, there was there was a decent amount of ice on the on the lakes. And but yet not too long after, we have this event where um, this year you might remember it was it was warm. It was really cold and then it warmed up again really fast. And this is causing the ice on the lakes to be like, we can't really be sure about them anymore. And so on March 3rd, 2021, a lot of that ice, especially if you look at Lake Superior, Lake Huron actually is an even better, better one to look at. Um, you can see that that ice has, has disappeared so fast, right? And so, this year, as somebody who ice fishes, I was paying attention to how many people went through the ice and the numbers were a lot higher. Um, and so if you were to look at the graphs of, of the temperature and the ice on ice off periods, you'd be able to see that over time, the amount of ice is actually going down. Here's a graph of that. So this is the ice cover on the Great Lakes as a percent. 
Um, the average from 1973 to 2020 is uh, that kind of dashed line through the middle. And you can see all those other lines that are in the background there, but they show all those other years, right? And so you can kind of see where the percentage ice cover has been. And you can see 2021 there. 2021 doesn't look too good. You can kind of see that, that time when uh, it got really cold in 2021 and it created that event where in February 20th, we had um, a decent amount of ice. And so if we think about this, right? She's ha she has a fever. She's telling us that there's something wrong. We need to listen to her. The waters are sick, right? I'm sure some of you have gone for a walk. Maybe you have kids and you've gone for a walk and you've seen fish that are, um, either there's been a big die off event, there's a lot of fish that are laying in the water, or maybe you've just gone to the water and you see all kinds of garbage and debris and water bottles that are inside of, inside of the lakes, right? Um, I go fishing with my partner Tanner quite a bit, and this is one of the things that I always pick up on. Even if you go into places that are like super remote, it's crazy. There's garbage there, and um, it's it's no wonder that the waters are telling us that they're sick. Um, so yeah, fish die off events. A lot of fish die off events are actually caused by temperature, and so this is one of um, the reasons that. This is one of the ways that we can listen to the waters, right? They're telling us that they're sick. Um, the amount of oxygen that is in water is really dependent on temperature. And so the lower the water, the higher oxygen levels typically. Um, and so on the right of the screen, you can see a little bit of a graphic that talks about um, fish and how fish respond to oxygen in, in the water, right? Um, when oxygen levels, people call it dissolved oxygen in the science world. Um, when oxygen in the water is higher than uh, nine parts per million, um, it supports abundant fish populations, right? And there's a lot of types of fish in Ontario that I'm sure people that like to fish, um, there's specific fish that we really like as humans for our sustenance that need high dissolved oxygen levels in the water. Things like brook trout, right? Things like rainbow trout all these cold water species they need high levels of oxygen um salmon as well you know they like if you think about it when they're out in the lakes they go really really deep because the water's colder down there and when they're in the rivers they're uh, they only come up in the rivers when the rivers are a certain temperature and so if we think about that we need to take care of the water because we need the water to be able to heal herself right and we need to bring down her fever Water can't see. I'm sure some of you have gone for a walk and you've seen rivers, maybe some ponds that look like this. And that's not good, right? The waters need to be clear and they need to be abundantly clear, right? When the waters look like this, when they look like mud or chocolate milk, um, I've heard a lot of trout fishermen say, when the water looks like chocolate milk, it's not a good time to go fishing. And um, if you think about that, right, it's because not only can the water not see, the fish can't see, right? And so if the fish can't see, they can't find their food, right? They're gonna struggle in order to survive. And what is this caused by? It's caused by erosion, right? If we go for a walk at a, at a stream, I, I can think of tons of rivers that feed into Lake Ontario and the GTA that look like this. And we need restoration activities, right? So if anybody here is in restoration, stream bank restoration is a huge need across a lot of Ontario. Um, the reason that the waters look like chocolate milk is because they're turbid, right? That's the fancy word that we use. Um, but this is caused by sedimentation and you know the erosion of, of banks. Um, and so restoration efforts can fix this. Uh, I believe it was Georgina Island First Nation. They had a really, really cool um, stream restoration project that they did recently. So if you want to check out something that was completely done by the community, you know, they had all the kids in there and they were doing a really awesome job. Um, I highly recommend you check that out because uh, it's pretty cool the way that they restored this small creek that runs through their community. Here's another picture. When I was doing my master's, uh, the creek that I was studying 
uh, it looked like this. So it is a tributary of the Grand River. And the Grand River was kind of clear, but the creek itself that I was studying looked like chocolate milk. And so if you went to that that area where the creek met the Grand River, there is this huge plume of sediment, of turbid water that would meet the Grand River. And, you know, you could tell there was something wrong just by looking at it, you know? You can't look at this picture and say that the, those waters are healthy because they're not. And there's something that we as humans can do to help them out. I mentioned fish, right? Um, when, erosion is happening, especially if you think of agricultural practices. Um, people are tilling their, their fields constantly, right? And if we, if we look at a lot of places where fish are trying to spawn, um, if you go for a walk, go for a walk by a creek and just take a look, look down into the water and look at how it, look at the pebbles, right? Look at the way that the, the ground looks. You can tell if an area is a good spawning habitat just by looking at those pebbles, right? If it's all sandy, there's certain fish that like sandy places, there's certain fish that don't. I'm talking about the ones that don't. Um, you know, things like salmon and trout and brook trout, red side dace, you know, they need these places that have pebbly areas so that they can, they can spawn properly. Um, things like walleye, right? There's this huge fishing industry that is surrounded by walleye. And if we as humans restore these areas so that they have good spawning habitat, there's going to be more fish, right? There will be more fish for many, many generations. Shawanaga is doing an amazing job at restoring the walleye population in Georgian Bay. Um, you know, and if there's ways that we can support communities that are doing that work, then we should be. Waters are sick. I've said this many times in this in this presentation. Um, another reason is the amount of salt that we use. I'm sure many of you have gone for a walk down the sh down the sidewalk or down the road. Even when you're driving, you know, after they've salted the roads, you can see that salt and it's just stuck to the to the road. Um, we as humans need to take a step back and look at what we're doing. We need to keep in mind all those other uh, beings in creation that are sensitive to things like salt. Here's a map of the chloride levels in uh, southern Ontario. Um, and you can see that the GTA is an area where um, chloride levels are very high, even in the summer, you know, um, places that I was studying when I was doing my master's, even when we would measure the um, chloride levels in the summer, they're very elevated and it ha all had to do with the amount of salt that we're using in the winter. Um, we as humans are not the only important people in the world, right? And so the amount of salt that we use can easily be uh, mitigated. There's actually some teenagers that are looking at using hemp, the hemp stalks, and mixing them with salt so that we can decrease the amount of salt that we're using on roads. They're doing a pilot project in Winnipeg right now that I think everybody should check out. Um, but yeah, the amount of salt. You can just walk carefully, you know, do the little penguin shuffle. Um, you don't have to use as much salt. So if, if you are somebody that puts down salt, keep this in mind, you know. Um, you can use other things like um, wood shavings, you know, if you have a piece of property and maybe you um, cut up firewood and stuff like that. You can use wood shavings from your chainsaw and they work just as well as using salt. Something that Corey wanted me to talk about is freshwater mussels just because I like mussels so much. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about freshwater mussels because they are a really cool bio indicator for when the water is sick. So um, freshwater mussels, depending on what compound or contaminant you're thinking about, um, some of them they're really sensitive to, and they're actually more sensitive to them than any other organism that you can study. Um, and so here's two really good examples. Um, the first one is chloride. So freshwater mussels are super sensitive to salt. Um, and then the other one is ammonia. Ammonia typically comes from wastewater treatment plants, whereas chloride usually comes from us salting our roads. Um, freshwater mussels at one point in time were very, very plentiful 
across Ontario, especially in the Grand River. There's actually reports that I read from the early 1900s that said things like, you know, the amount of mussels would cover the entire stream bed. This is something that a lot of us, we can't even imagine, right? Um, you just imagine like going to a river and the entire river being covered in mussels at the bottom of the stream. That's how much work they were doing as a community. You know, they are sucking up this water and cleaning it. And I have a picture in a little bit that I wanted to show you guys. So something that a lot of people don't really think about, um, generally, because a lot of people don't really think about mussels, is that there's actually one thing, there's actually 53 species of mussels that uh, you can find within the borders of Canada. Um, most people, when you think of a mussel, you probably don't even think that there's different species of them, but there's actually 53 in Canada. Um, in Ontario, there's 41 of those 53, and 15 of them are listed as species at risk, which is almost 70%, or sorry, 40%. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so almost 40%, that's a lot. And it's important to make sure that we have freshwater mussels because they clean the water. That's their responsibility to the rest of creation from what I've been taught. And so as humans, we need to make sure that there are freshwater mussels as well as other fish and you know macroinvertebrates and stuff like that because they are really important to us. We need to have a reciprocal relationship with them. So here's this picture I wanted to show you guys. It's actually something that um, I really love showing people. It's not from my research, but it's from somebody else's research. I put the citation down at the bottom. Um, so they actually did a small experiment where they took some of this turbid water, you know, this water that's coming from somewhere that's probably got erosion happening upstream. And they had one fish tank with no mussels and one fish tank they put eight mussels. After 24 hours, you can see a drastic difference between uh, the water quality that's inside of these two these two tanks. Um, and so when I show you this picture, I want you to imagine these turbid rivers, but fill them with mussels, right? Because that's their responsibility. Mussels in Ontario um, are at risk for many different reasons. Um, one is wastewater treatment plants. They're sensitive to pollutants, right? They're sensitive to pollutants at different times in their life too, when they're little, when they're, um, you know, they've got all these crazy life stages. So they've got glochidia where they're just floating in the water and they attach to fish and they actually live on fish for a while. Um, they've got the juvenile stage where they're completely buried in the sediment. And so they'll get exposed to things that are um, more like PAHs, you know, things that can go into the sediment and just stay there. And then they also get exposed to things that are, um, within the water as an adult, because as an adult, they stick their heads up above the, um, the sediment line and they, they suck in all that water and they're constantly being exposed to all of the particulate matter that's floating around. Here's a figure from um, my master's research. Um, so when I talk about water, that the water is speaking to us, sometimes when the water is tired, she asks other, beings to speak for her, right? And this is when she's telling us that there's something wrong, you know? And so sometimes these other beings like freshwater mussels will speak for the water. Um, here's a figure from my master's thesis. And one of the things that I found was this area, I can't actually talk about it too much because I'm currently writing the manuscript to publish it, but um, we found that there is a place in the creek that I studied that is likely affecting the population of mussels at this one location because of certain things that they are inputting into the water. Um, and so you can see this, right? It's very, very obvious when you look at, um, this is the length of the mussels um, compared to um, how many mussels we actually found. So you can see that upstream of this spot, you know, there's, there's quite a few mussels that are um, around the same length and then downstream of this location the mussels not only are the mussels smaller but their their populations are taking a hit and so you know there's all different ways that we can listen to the water sometimes we can take simply just measuring some mussels there's other beings too right that teach us to listen um, and these are things like sunfish. There's actually a study done, 
think it was in the Hamilton Harbor. <laughs> I'm trying to remember right now, but they were using sunfish to understand um, if sunfish can be used as a bioindicator. For a long time, it's just been freshwater mussels and fathead minnows, macroinvertebrates. But um, there's this new study that was done where they expose sunfish to wastewater treatment plants. And they're finding that um, fish that are downstream of wastewater treatment plants are, their health is worse. They're um, having to work more in order to, um, for example, eat, eat the amount of food that they need in order to survive their own of work. Um, they're finding that for um, fathead minnows, you know, they're being exposed to antidepressants and they're being a little bit more relaxed, you know, and if you're more relaxed, you're gonna be at greater risk of, of getting eaten by a predator, right? And so there's all kinds of different studies that are done on this. I could list them, but you guys can go and find them if you want to. And then finally, the other bioindicators are, are macroinvertebrates. Um, and this is something that if you teach out of school or maybe you run after school programs or even you do work with youth, um, doing small studies with macroinvertebrates to try to understand the health of the water in your community is actually quite easy to do. Um, depending on how many and what macroinvertebrates you find, those little bugs that are in the water, I always say when I'm with, when I'm with kids, um, we can learn to understand, to listen to what the water's saying just by um, observing what's actually happening and who's there, right? Who's there and who's not there because that can really tell us um, what's going on in the system. It's kind of like if you sit down for a meeting with a bunch of humans, right? If you look around and you're noticing that somebody's not there, who's missing from that conversation that should be there, right? And so, I'm just reminding everybody that the waters are, are speaking to us, right? They're telling us what is wrong and they're telling us what they need. And it's our responsibility as humans to listen to them and to act, right? To take action and to uphold our responsibility. I think, because I don't want to go too long. <laughs> Um, I wanted to finish by um, putting a list of some Indigenous water, land, and language initiatives that um, you guys can support. Um, I think it's very, very important to support Indigenous communities. After all, there's research that shows that even though we only make up 5% of the global population, we're protecting 80% of global biodiversity. And so um, supporting Indigenous initiatives for water, land, and language revitalization. Um, sovereignty and advocacy is really important. Um, the water walkers are currently actually doing a water walk. I think they're up in Spanish Ontario right now. Um, and so if you want to support the water walkers, they uh, walk around water bodies and rivers and all kinds of stuff to bring advocacy towards taking care of the water. Um, there's also Onacanos, which is uh, located in Six Nations. They do podcasts and interviews and stuff like that. Um, there's the picking up the bundles canoe journey that happens. Um, 1492 Land Back Lane online auction, if you guys want to support um, indigenous land sovereignty. There's also Ongolwana Conchiogua, which is a, a Mohawk immersion school in Six Nations. And then there's also the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force. So if anybody here does um, environmental sciences, maybe you work for um, Environment Canada, right? Um, the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force is composed of Haudenosaunee people who have specialties in science and who are working to protect uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy lands. And so if you're wanting to connect with people for a project or something like that, I highly recommend them. I'm going to pass it back over to Marilyn. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much, Erin. That was incredible. Uh, thank you very much for that. And um, uh, just before we have Marilyn close up the day, I just wanted to open the floor up uh, to see if anyone had any questions um, for Erin or um, Marilyn. I 
I know there was one uh, interest of putting those, uh, getting those links from you uh, after Erin, so we can share them further. Yeah, I can put them in the chat actually. Erin, I downloaded a freshwater mussel app um, that someone recommended to me. Could it, what, what are your thoughts on that? Useful, not useful? I think it's just surveying where people yeah, find I think, mussel species. Yeah, I actually really love that app. Um, and I always highly recommend it for anybody that works with kids. Um, the only thing that you need to keep in mind when using that app is that it's actually freshwater mussel habitat is protected by law. And so because so many freshwater mussels are considered at risk in Ontario. Um, but, you know, like just being able to go out with kids or even by yourself, like say you like to just go out and hang out in the bush. Um, the more mussels that you can actually identify, DFO takes that data and is using it for trying to understand mussel habitat. Um, you know, mussel habitat is really all over Ontario. There's specific mussels that you'll find in the north. There's specific mussels that you'll find in the south. And so using an app like that is really helpful because it helps with citizen science, which I think is really important. Um, the more we can encourage everyday people to be taking care of Mother Earth, right? Whether that's through using an app to look at which muscles are where, or whether that's doing things like macroinvertebrate studies, right? Um, it what what's important with it is that we're restoring our relationship with remembering our responsibility. So. If it's using an app, I'm all for it. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's called Clam Counter. Is that the one that you have? That's the one. Yeah, that one's awesome. <laughs> I love those ID I apps. List in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Does anybody else have any more questions for our wonderful speakers? Um, also, Aaron, so you have a lot of app, our, um, um, web links in your presentation. Are those going to be, uh, I, I mean, I tried to get some of those while you were talking, but are those going to be somewhere where people can access them? Yeah, so I'm putting them in the chat right now. I don't know if you can access it. I can send them to Corey after. I'll put a link to, I think I had a link to my thesis too. I don't know if you guys want to read my thesis. It's super long, but <laughs> uh, feel free to. I mean, there's some good information in there. <laughs> so you've popped up, Fred. Yeah, I'd just like to invite Aaron and anybody else that wants to come to Kempville Creek to uh, see our mud puppies. And, you know, we run mud puppy night in Oxford Mills. And um, you didn't mention mud puppies. Um, they're really, really, really special inhabitants of southern Canada's waters all the way up to the Arctic watershed. And um, and I'd really like to show you our, our creek. Awesome. Do you have a, a email or a link? If you pop that into the chat, I'll, I'll shoot you an email. <laughs> oh, well, you can get my, my email from, from Linda. Because, um, yeah, or I could put it in the chat. Um, yeah, and it's nice to see all this work. I mean, all this work on the Grand River. And, and I remember back when we were first working with the Amer Canadian Museum of Nature. Well, it's now the Canadian Museum of Nature. There was, there was this guy who was doing a PhD on the, the mussel fauna of the Grand River. And, and there's so much of that um, drainage that's been wiped out, wiped out by things that have happened since then. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah.
Definitely. And I've also heard many fantastic things about the Oxford Mills Mud Puppy Night. I know all of my colleagues thoroughly enjoy that experience. So um, I would definitely recommend following up with Fred if, if, if for those of you who are interested in that, because I know um, that it's just an incredible time. I've never seen a mud puppy yet, so I might also hop on that. <laughs> I've only ever seen them in a tank. <laughs> Now, mud puppy night occurs mostly in, in occurs in the winter and the fall, but there's an awful lot of stuff that goes on in the creek um, in in the summer. So if people want to come around in the summer, now that some of us have been vaccinated adequately, we're really always glad to have have guests. That's awesome. Fred, you should also tell them about collecting mussel shells from different parts of Ontario as well, but you, you take those uh, mussel shells. Yeah, mussel shells aren't protected and, and if you can collect them and, and get them to us, um, there's, it, it, it's, we, well, my wife Alita did the illustration, the watercolor paintings of the mussels for Arthur Clark's Freshwater Mussels of Canada back in the early seventies. And so we sort of got into mussels you know, we'd collect them for the museum without paying much attention to them. But then when the zebra mussels came and started to wipe out populations, we got into them in a big way. And, and all these species at risk, we've been involved with almost all the discoveries of species at risk populations east of Toronto, because there's no support for exploration. Species at risk work is always about studying or or helping known populations and um and so there's just huge huge gaps in our knowledge of where the species of mussels are found there was one place on the petawawa river where where the trans canada highway crosses it and we went 150 meters further upstream than we had in the previous previous visits, and we added a new species to the fauna. And Alita went, was painting about two kilometers downstream from the Trans Canada, and we added another species to the known fauna, which was a. Both of these were big range extensions, so so we're always willing to take eggs full of shells, um, and, and the nice thing is that you can document occurrences without harming any living organisms. That's awesome information. Thank you, Fred, for sharing that. And I'll definitely know to keep my mussel shells next time if I find anything neat, because I definitely like to pick up neat things while I'm poking around in the water. So good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Um, does it, oh, sorry, I see you. Did you sell something to say, Fred? I'm sorry, I saw your mouth move. Whenever. Cool thing about mussel shells that I'll mention real quick is that um, there are certain species of freshwater mussels in southern Ontario that, you know, sometimes they can get to be like the size of your face, if you can believe that. Um, but in the old days, I was actually taught by my buddy, uh, Caleb Musgrave. He's from Hiawatha First Nation. Um, he runs a company called Canadian Bushcraft, but he actually um, learned that in the old days, people would actually take these huge mussel shells and turn them into garden hose. So our ancestors, um, specifically my ancestors, you know, we we're huge into farming, Haudenosaunee people, it's a ginormous part of our culture. Um, these mussel shells that were ginormous would be turned into a garden hose. So, uh, you know, there's many different uses for freshwater mussels. <laughs> Just a fun fact. <laughs> that is a fun fact. Thanks for sharing that. So cool. So cool. Well, if, does anybody else have any more questions um, or comments before I have uh, Marilyn close off our meeting? That was a suspenseful pause. <laughs> um, oh, see, I saw you pop up. I, I just wanted to quickly thank 
Aaron and Marilyn for doing this today. You know, it was amazing. And Aaron, to see, you know, the difference in a day that eight muscles can make, uh, that's such a powerful visual. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much to both of you. And yeah, Jimmy Quetch.